Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to what I'm going to call my Wandering In special. So if you've just wandered in, welcome. Uh, this is going to be a single review, um, and hopefully I'll have a, a interview attached with Andrea Parsno, um, who I'm trying to get to schedule with right now. So this is me recording the inter the, uh, <laughs> the the review itself, uh, and I'm going to be talking to her about getting the interview done later on this week. So I'll have a, a special out with just this book. And that's what you're listening to right now. Um, and I've also asked Pirate Abba, or Pirate Abba, or Pirabata, however you want to say it, but Pirate Abba, uh, to um, partake in the episode. And the, the they, they pretty much said, Arr, I love to do so, but I must decline it this time. Me parrot a sick. No, that's not what they said. Um, they said, Arr. And that's all they told me. No, again, I'm just being stupid. Um, Pirate Abba was very kind and just basically said, I, I don't want to reveal my identity, um, my gender, or my whatever it is, in any capacity to my fans. They only know me as Pirate Abba. Um, Dancing Queen. Yeah, Pirate Abba. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, Fernando knows. Um, they, they very kindly declined um, and did offer to allow me to ask them some questions, you know, um, like I would write something down and they would respond back. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to do that. I don't think I'm going to uh, read off, like, my questions and then answers because I would have to do that in, like, a silly voice and, you know, like, for, for Pirate Abba. It would be dis disrespectful, uh, to say the least, to make them sound silly. Um, and, and I respect that, um, you know, they want to have their privacy. I did offer to do the voice modulation and have the light behind them and have the dark in front so we couldn't see. Maybe put a, put a you know, a blanket over them or something so that we wouldn't be able to see who it is. But again, they, they declined, and that's fine. Um, that's their right, and, and I completely understand that. Um, and believe me, my narration skills, like, like it, my narration skills, my interview skills are not even close to being decent enough to to do that with the pirate. Um, I feel bad for Andrea, who has to endure my stupid questions. Um, but anyway, I have blabbled and babbled far enough into this, this intro. Uh, so let me just say, welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am Ray, um, your host, and today I'm going to be very exclusively focusing on The Wandering Inn. Now, The Wandering Inn, this is Volume 1. Uh, it is written by, as I said before, Pirate Abba, narrated by Andrea Parsnow, and it has a book length of 43 hours and 10 minutes. And no, I didn't goof it up. It's 43 hours and 10 minutes. The inn was dark and empty. It stood silent on the grassy hilltop, the ruins of other structures around it. Rot and age had brought low other buildings, the weather and wildlife had reduced stone foundations to rubble and stout wooden walls to a few rotten pieces of timber mixed with the ground. But the inn still stood. It was waiting. Not in a sentient, thinking way, but in the way all buildings wait. It was waiting for someone to find it. For wasn't that the purpose of an inn? And someone did find it. A young woman stumbled through the grass up the hill. Her knees were shaking and she was gasping for air. Her lungs burned. Her right arm was burned. Smoke was still rising from the charred fabric on one shoulder and her legs were bleeding. Several shallow cuts had torn open her pants at the back of the legs. But still, she climbed the hill because of the inn. So for all you audio listeners out there, uh, you know, I know the first thing you're going to say is, holy crap, how can I list, listen to... 40 hours plus of any kind of a story. Uh, it's it's practically impossible. There's, it would just take forever to do that. And I say, nay, 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 nay. Um, as an example, uh, one of the narrators who I first became acquainted with when I started listening to audiobooks was a, a man named Michael Naramore. Uh, Michael Naramore is a really good narrator, and he's got a huge series of books that he's um, narrated in different genres, and I've got practically all of them. Um, I really like him a lot. Well, J.S. Morin had written a book, or I should say a series of books, like 
16 books, and they were shorter length books. Um, but JS put that all into one collection. And if you want to know how long it was, I'll tell you it was 85 hours. 85 hours. So if you're going to ask me, Ray, what's the longest audiobook you've ever listened to? I would say it was Galaxy Outlaws, The Complete Black Ocean Mobius Missions, 1 through 16.5. Without a doubt, without hesitation, I can tell you that. It was huge. And it was really good. And it was also enough that, like, like I say in the story, I got to know the characters in depth. I got to know them very well. I got to know a lot about them. And it felt like I had lived amongst the crew. I felt like I was a crew member. And I want to come back now and talk about what I'm supposed to be talking about, and that's The Wandering In. And the book is a substantial 40 hours, but I did it in just a couple days. Um, I mean, I listened to it pretty much every opportunity I had because, first, it's really that good. It's 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 an amazing story. Um, it, it, and I'm going I'm to put it right now out like this, okay? You know, you know, I hate, I hate, I hate slice of life books. And I've been struggling to kind of get past that, that, that bias a lot. Uh, and in fact, I think in my last show, I talked about like in Varnoff, the Black Blade, how I've really been trying really hard not to allow my bias against slice of life books, um, you know, turn me around and make me just say the hell with it. I'm done. I'm not doing a slice of like book. Um, because I think to me, uh, if you want to know the, the, the real reason why I don't like slice of like books, and I, I go back to a certain few series in my life. Like I will always talk about dragon Lance, the first six books, probably the best set of books I've ever read bar none. I don't care who wrote what, um, the characters and the story were just incredible. And the last three books, Absolutely the best books I've ever read. I love the characters and the way things happen. Um, another series of books are the first three uh, um, <clears throat> Sword of Shinar books. Sword of Shinar, Elfstones, and Wish Song. Now, Wish Song I won't talk about too much because it's just an okay story. Um, Elfstones, incredible. It blew me away. It was that thick, and it was one of those things that... Um, it really helped solidify my love for the fantasy genre um, because I had read The Hobbit years years prior as a really small kid. Um, and, and then there's The Sword of Shannara. And The Sword of Shannara is that thick, which that equates to 700 hours audio narration in my mind. Okay, um, It is the most slice of life book I've ever read because it goes on and 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 goes nowhere. It's actually probably one of the first books I ever had to just say, I have to walk away from this. I put it back on a shelf, and it was years later before I decided I needed to finish the book. Because why? If you know me, Ray always finishes his books. Um, and I have a rule now that when I start it, no matter what else is going on, I finish the book I've started because I'm not going to jump back and forth between different stories and get myself confused and things like this. But I, I, I think that if I get the book, I deserve to do... I, I, I think the, the listeners of this podcast and the writers and the narrators deserve for me to put a review out there, okay? Um, because I, I am putting in the time and I need to put that time in to do the job, and I, you know, I always say, I always re leave a review. I don't ever not leave a review unless a book is so awful that I can't stand it. And in that case, I'm being very kind and I, I don't want to leave like a one or two star. Three stars are devastating, believe it or not. Um, so if you're not going to leave like a four or five star, you didn't hate the book, don't leave a review. Um, you know, because it just, it takes down the author's score and it, it crushes books. And in this case, in this case, um, Sword of Shannara was one of those ones I had to go back and, and, and you just get it. But it was one of those things. It completely put me off of Slice of Life books because even though it has a story that actually has a point to, you know, from point A to point B, and it gets there, everything from A until the, the very line of B it's just trash. I mean, it's just, it's just a lot of build up and information dump and, and stuff like that. And, and rather than just telling a really good, exciting story that I was expecting, because I read Elfstones of Shannara first and Elfstones is a short story. 
And I don't mean that like as in like it's you know less than ten thousand words. I mean it's it's a small book, and they talked about all the great stuff that happened in in the Sora Shinora. and so I'm expecting this grand, amazing story, and I get crap. So I really don't like wandering, wandering tales. Now, that being said, and, and again I digress, but there's a point to all my madness. Um, the Wandering Inn is very much claimed to be a slice of life book. Now, I don't know. I know it's serialized. It is on Royal Road. Um, and Pirate Abba makes their living off of, you know, like, uh, fans that send in money, you know, through a Patreon page or whatever. And, uh, it's a serialized story that comes out every every Thursday, I think. And honestly, I don't know um, because I don't have time to read. Uh, that's why I listen to audiobooks. So I only knew of the story because of other people on Facebook talking about how great it was. And I always said, well, I really hope someday they make this into an audiobook. And so when Andrea Parsonneau first announced that she was doing the book, I was like, first off, great. I've been waiting to hear the story. Secondly, Great. Andrea is amazing. I know she's not going to drop the ball. She's going to take this thing across the one yard line and spike the ball in one of the other players' eyes. And she does. Okay. But anyway, um, I was just kind of like on tender hooks waiting for this book to show. And then when I saw, you know, I know that she had been recording for a while. And I'm like, what's taking so long? It was a 40 hour book. I'm like, holy crap. 40 hours. Now, I mean, like I said, I just came off of, and I don't want to say just, because it was like years back. Um, I, I had, had done the the Galaxy Outlaws, and that was the very beginning of 2018. So, you know, pretty much two years ago at this point almost. Um, I think Galaxy Outlaws came out in February. But um, I, I had still been through that, and and I said, well, this is going to be a slice of life story. That's what everybody. It's what everybody calls it. It's what everybody says. Slice of life, and it's going to take me forever to get through. It's forty hours. The only thing I have going for me is I know Andrea is going to make every part of it incredible. It's going to be amazing, and she's going to kill and steal every scene that she possibly can. Now, lo and behold, my shock! I get the book, and I'm listening to it. And I'm like, yeah, I can see how this might be considered a slice of life uh, as uh, the the main character uh, finds herself in, you know, this fantasy world all of a sudden and so on and so forth. But at the same time, at the same time, there are progressions that go as, you know, the MC um, finds herself in this world. She's she's helpless. She finds an inn. She takes it over as a place to sleep. Um, and she ends up, you know, working on it a little bit. And as time goes on, she claims it as her own. And so her story kind of has a very solid beginning. And then it takes a long time to get to the end of where we stop at book one. Now, I know Andrea has already announced that there's going to be a book two uh, and it will come out sometime like June of next year. And if I got that wrong, I'm not sure I'll ask her in the interview, but it's a ways off. It's a ways off coming because it's going to be even longer. I think it's going to be like 60 hours. Um, so she's probably going to try like in book three to get my record and she's going to try and break the 85 hour mark for me, which is fine. I could totally live with that. I don't know if my phone, uh, you know, it, if this phone has capacity to hold that much, I'm, I'm you know, I, I don't think I could do, um, 85 hours on my phone. Uh, so geez, I'm hoping, I'm hoping it doesn't quite get that long. Uh, because this is before I even started listening on my cell phone. I, I used to, uh, listen all the time in my car. And anyway, uh, the, the overall arching story does have a beginning and a middle, and it kind of has a nice ending for a first book. Now, it's not exactly what you expect, and that's good. It's great. But let me just say, the book is kind of split between two MCs. There's the innkeeper, and then there's the runner. Now, I really like Aaron, the the MC of the you know the inn, the the, the innkeeper. She's really great, uh, very fun. Um, she's not 
someone that you, you you know you when you first see her running through the 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 fantasy world, she's not someone you expect is going to be tough and and hail and hearty, but you know it's it's her story, so she's going to have to, as they say, man up, and you know kind of toughen herself to the the extremes of the environment. Um, the other character is uh, a runner, and I think it's Ryoka, and I'm, I'm probably going to mispronounce it, but anyway, uh, she is very unlikable. Very, very unlikable. And I don't know if that's intentional or not, because Aaron is all sugary sweet, and Ryoka is... Um, she's like glass in your honey, okay? Uh, you know, you think you're getting something nice, and then you get all sliced up. Uh, she is not very good. She's acerbic. She is domineering. She literally is antisocial, and... She's a little racist, if you want to know the truth of it. I mean, if you want me to tell you the truth, um, there are several times she makes a remark in the stories that I'm like, really? You know, was that necessary? Um, because she, she's, she's partially Asian, and I'm not sure how much, how much, little, how much not. But um, she makes remarks about other races in the book that never needs to be made. Um, and I can tell you right now, I can listen to a story about a racist guy or girl as long as it's, it's there's a real reason for the character being racist. You know, like, like okay, that guy's a Nazi. Great. I get it. He, he's not going to like certain kinds of people. And that's his character. Um, but like these are just kind of off the cuff remarks. Like the, the one like she's like, well, I would never give these kind of uh, weapon ideas to a white woman, especially. And I'm like, what is her color? of her skin have to do with, you know, the, the person herself, you know, I would just never give that kind of power to a person, you know, in royalty or, or you know, whatever you want to do, but twice, or maybe three times. And, and forgive me if I'm misremembering, but I know there's at least twice where she makes that kind of a comment and, and it just kind of slips out. And that bothered me a, a little bit um, because she's already not nice. And, it, you know, you're supposed to be sympathetic towards her. But at no point, at no point did I ever feel like uh, she was amazing or cool. Um, I think that, you know, she's a jerk um, and she acts like a jerk to everybody, even the people who are trying to help her. And there, there's no real, like at the end, I, I could say, okay, she has some growth and realizations on things. But for 99% of the story... She is just very self-centered, very selfish, um, and she lives in her own little world. And anybody who dares to step into that world, uh, they suffer for it. And, and in fact, there's points where um, there, there's characters in the story, the other runners, who try to teach her a lesson. And, and of course, what they do is completely wrong, and they do it for the exact wrong reasons. But the way that she behaves, you know, the runner, uh, I get it. You know, she probably had stepped on a lot of toes, you know, metaphorically, um, before it got to that point where people were really irritated with her. Because, like I say, there's nothing that she ever does that makes anything about her likable. Nothing. Um, now, I did like her story. You know, her arch was pretty good. And I liked the fact that, you know, she was willing to do crazy stuff. And that's what earned, like, a lot of respect from other people and so on and so forth. But her, her own attitude is like, I don't want to learn or level or gain skills. I don't want any of that. I just want to do like this one thing and that's it. So she completely like holds the world and other people at arm's, arm's length. And, you know, that's in contrast to the innkeeper, uh, you know, Aaron, who, who is accepting of everybody, even the people that you shouldn't accept, like goblins. You know, these are the murdering fiends of the wilderness. They rape and murder and pillage and burn and kill. And she's attacked by them multiple times, multiple times. And yet she still has an open door policy, um, you know, about like not killing goblins and helping them out, and, you know, doing things. And, and of course, her perspective wins out in, in the end because uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but she she earns respect from the goblins, okay? And it proves a lot of stuff in the book, like about how she is personally. Because when she first comes to this world, 
she's not really appreciated. She she meets these drakes, these lizard people, um, and ant people, and um, gnolls, and you know the, the gnolls think she stinks because she's a human and she doesn't bathe, and and you know everybody just there's a lot of bias against her for being human more than anything, and she doesn't hold any of their races against them in her mind. Like she doesn't say, you know, drakes are, are creepy because they're reptilian, even though she calls them lizard people or like, you know, she doesn't freak out because the antinium are, are, you know, huge ants or, you know, the gnolls are kind of like hyenas. So you would almost say like, they're like werewolves in a certain aspect, the way they would stand and behave, you know, and I don't know if I'm walking down the street and I see a werewolf, I'm freaking out. Well, she doesn't. She handles herself and composes herself very well in every situation. And she treats everybody with respect. So again, there's the dichotomy. Everybody gets respect from the innkeeper and the runner gives nobody any respect. And the problem is, is like most people don't respect the innkeeper that should. And the problem is, is the people that do respect the runner shouldn't. Okay. And by that, I mean like Aaron, poor innkeeper, she does things and, and, and she's very self-sufficient and her self-sufficiency um, irritates people because it causes problems. And then, like, you know, certain drakes, and like I said, I'm trying not to spoil anything, they get upset with her and they don't want to talk to her or see her anymore. They don't want to come out to the, to the inn. And for, you know, Ryoka, um, the runner, you, you know, there's a minotaur who just thinks she's she's the stuff. Um, she's top dog. And he's like, yeah, she is a really cool human. I want to get with that in some capacity because she's pretty awesome. And they, they, they kind of see that she's a total jerk over time. No matter what they do, she's just, she's just a total ass. So there's a lot of dichotomy between the two. Like, you know what this one is, this one isn't and so on and so forth. And, you know, I appreciate that. It, it does give it to you, but honestly, Ryoka, she annoyed me every chance that she had on the, on, on the page. Um, and like I say, the, the mild racism, Okay, I get it. You know, that's just a perspective. But it, it was just, it was totally unnecessary to the story. Totally unnecessary. And I really did just, if it had been, if she had said that about any other race, you know, if she'd been, I would never give that to a, to a black lady. I would have been like, what the hell? You know? And it's the same thing here. You know, it was just really bizarre. And I don't know if it's because she, they, they, that the, the pirate Abba thinks she's, she's Asian, so it's okay um, to do something like that. But again, it's just so off the cuff and just so right out real quick and done. I, I doubt most people would notice it or let it bother them, but it does me. It does me. Um, you know, and like I say, I, I'm, I'm against that in any form whatsoever. I mean, my, I have a daughter who's biracial, uh, you know, I have kids who are autistic. So I've got, you know, different things going on in my family. You know, I've got kids who are foster kids. I've adopted them. They have their own issues. Um, my family is a very big blended family and we don't hold anything against anybody. And, you know, to have anybody say anything negative just because of who they are without any kind of real knowledge. And if they just make it about them, that bugs me. And again, like I said, I can handle racism in, in stories. Uh, I can handle racist characters. There just has to be a reason. There's got to be a good motivation. And as long as it's fine, it's okay because it's part of the story. Um, here, it just zoop, zips out. So, no more of that. I'm just letting that one go. Um, the story itself is really fun. It's really, really fun. I really loved watching Aaron grow as an innkeeper and leveling. And I loved her, like, uh, she gets a very special skill, which is called, like, you know, and I, I'm probably going to mess it up, but it's an immortal moment. And the immortal moment lets her, like, not pause time, but expand time so that like amazing things happen in the time that she's think things are happening so like you know she sings songs uh that she knows from like earth and the people that are listening to her also hear like the singer and the music of that that song so like, you know, she's here she's singing like you know the carpenter song they hear karen carpenter and they hear you know the, the music and so on and so forth. And, and it was like a really great amazing scene and it was just perfect um Everything I, I have to say, the, the characters in the books are very well thought out. They're they're very well fleshed out. They all have very good backstories. Um, I didn't think there was any issues whatsoever from any point of view with anybody speaking or doing things. I think that you get to know them pretty quickly. You know, so that when you meet them, 
you see who they are, and then everything's backed up by their story in the, in the past. Um, everybody has ulterior motives in the story, except for Relk. Uh, Relk, the, the Drake, you know, he he pretty much is he is what you see is what you get kind of guy. Everybody else wants you know the innkeeper for some purpose or another. Whatever it is, they want her, and it's the same thing with the runner. The people that know her, uh, or you know, kind of know where she's from or what she is, they want her pretty bad, and so it's just one of those things where um, things like the characters and things like that they meet, and it's very realistic. Uh, you don't go, this doesn't feel natural. It's very organic, uh, and like I say, when the the sparks start to fly, and I don't mean like as in lovey kind of sparks. I mean like you know we're we're hitting flint and steel, bing bing bing, um, and, and sparks are flying because this character does this and this character does that, and then there's tension. It's a real tension. That's how well developed the characters are. But again, you've got forty hours to build up a lot of information on these characters, so. Um, that is a real p- bonus. It's a plus in my mind. Uh, the overarching story, like I say, it does start very simply, but it has a real point at the end. Things happen, and you you go, holy crap, didn't expect that. Did not expect that. Uh, if you know me at all, you know I love when characters die. There have to be stakes. There have to be, like, not everybody lives, you know, um, this isn't like the Lord of the Rings where, you know, Aragorn makes it and, and Gimli makes it and, you know, everybody, even the hobbits who've got like no reason to survive. It would have been great if like Sam and, you know, Frodo had died in the Hobbit, you know, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy uh, at the end at Mount Doom. If he had just burned up in the lava um, because that would have been realistic. Uh, and I think that, you know, how they escape is just a cheat. Uh, and I've always said that, like, Tolkien, always, anytime he got himself brushed into a corner, um, all he had to do was say, hey, eagles, and then the eagles were there. And and it just annoys the crap out of me, because it's just, it's a deus as ex machina kind of thing. And so, you know, there are consequences to, you know, things that characters do. Like, they know they're going to go here and do this, and this could be wrong, and they pay for it in some capacity. Um, and I'm not going to tell you who dies or how they die or whatever happened, but I will say there is a lot of consequences and there are high stakes. And so, you know, you can be very attached. And I will tell you, uh, mm-hmm. Andrew had me choked up. Um, there is a scene from one of my favorite characters um, where terrible things happen. And I, I, I was like, my God, I, I, I don't think I can go to work today. Wait, I am working because I'm driving the car as I'm driving to work. Okay, so I had to go to work, even though like a horrible thing happened in the story. Um, it was very impactful, you know. Like, like you, you carry the guilt over what happens just as much as you know the characters do, or you know you regret things as much as the characters do. So it's it's pretty powerful. It's it's a really good story, um, and and that's where I like to say the mesh up of the characters and the, the tale worked so, so, so very well. Um, Pirate Abba, very clearly, this is not something that they sat down and just said, okay, um, a girl goes to the bathroom, and instead of going into her toilet, she she ends up in the dragon's den. And then I'll figure it out from here. Very, very clearly, the pirate has plans and has lined out a lot of stuff. And I'm going to be frank with you. Um, I really, 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 really did not expect this book to go the way that it did. I was expecting something along of, and, and if you're a comic book geek like me, um, Neil Gaiman's Sandman, there, there's a run called uh, The Inn at the End of the World or something like that, which it, it has like this inn that sets in this interdimensional nexus, and the whole story is based on the, the guests that come to the tavern, the inn, uh, and the things that they do as they go forth. So there's like four or five different stories that revolve around the characters in the inn itself. And that was more what I was expecting. I was gonna, I was kind of saying, okay, so like, you know, the innkeeper will be 
the, the, the rock that things start off each chapter with or something like that. And then we'll meet some really cool characters and then we'll just kind of deviate, see what happens to them. And then we'll come back at the end uh, and then it'll be back to the innkeeper. And it's not what happens. Um, it, it's all about the inn and Aaron and, and so on and so forth. Um, as they, they go through um, their, their, the story and, and, and that, that is, like I say, it's an incredible thing because it's so well, very clearly written. Like there's no question, uh, you know, that they know what they're doing. Whoever, whoever the writer is, you know, he or she, I hate to use the pronoun game. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, uh, this is just one of those stories that there is very clearly a concept, an idea, and at least I don't know if there's an end point in mind. I would, I, I would imagine not at this point. I think that, you know, Pirate Abba makes their living, you know, doing the serialized thing, um, from their Patreons. So I don't know, but we'll see. Now, I, and I've talked a lot about the story. So let me get into Andrea Parsno. Andrea just, I mean, she is the book. Um, and I, like I say, there, there are times where you say, my gosh, you know, this this narrator becomes the character, or this narrator, you know, that that's their series. And and I'm saying, Parsno is this book, body and soul, um, 100% down the line. There's no question. Everything that Andrea Parsno is is in this book. Um, she has bled for this book, cried for this book, uh, sweated for this book, you know, burped for this book. I mean, you name it, it's in there. Uh, you can tell right away. I mean, the, the, the characters' lives are so vibrant, so clear and crisp and real. And like I always say, like Andrea is one of these people that, like, I, I know I probably beat this every time I talk about her, but she really impresses the emotions of a scene and the characters better than 99% of the narrators I know. And I have favorite narrators and things like that, but... Each one has a speciality, okay? I mean, like, each one has an ability to do something that none of the others can do. And Andrea, I mean, she, she gives you vocal hints and clues. If she knows something that you don't, she will, will hide that in her voice and tell you, here's why this character is feeling this way, even though you don't know it and you can pick it up. You can, you can kind of say, okay, I can see what, what she's saying here just by the way she said this. So, you know, I, you know, I always, I always joke about people going for the Oscars, but this is totally like Grammy style performance. Um, it is so intense and so real. Uh, I just really don't know how she was able to do this, especially that if there were 40 hours in the book, she probably put three times that into the story itself. Uh, you know, with retakes and double takes and editing and, you know, did this work out? No, let me go back and do this. Uh, she just really, really, really animates this story. It, it is, you know, I always, I always say like the, there's a theater of the mind, you know, I sit down with my popcorn, I put on my earbuds and I sit here and just listen and I can see everything is happening for me. And, you know, a good story can, can kind of like be carried even by a bad narrator, but this is not the case. This is the case of we have a great story and we have a great narrator. And this elevates, honestly, um, the story to a whole new, you know, atmospheric level. You know, let's go fly a kite up where the air is clear. You know, um, we, we are past kite flying levels um, because she really, really um, provides voices for everybody. You know who they are. Uh, there's never a question as to their gender uh, or their personality type, because if they're snooty, they are snooty as they are being, you know, being read by her. And, you know, um, <laughs> so, you know, she she just has this catalog and I don't know how she does it. With the, there's so many characters in this book, um, this catalog. And the only thing I will say is the Antinium sound like they're all pretty much closely the same thing, but that's OK. Uh, because they're ants, and I don't think ants are going to have a lot of variation in their voices. You know, an ant's going to speak like an ant, and that's it. Um, the ants really, really, you know, 
even with their their almost similar voices, are dissimilar enough that I know when Kilba Catch is speaking as compared to somebody else. Uh, and man, if I can say Kilba Catch now, I, I'm just stunned because I would never be able to do that before. Uh, but I've heard the word and the name repeated so often. I needed 40 hours of Kilba Catch. And I can't even do the way that she does, like the, the ants K Kilba Catch. You know, she does this thing and, and she's amazing with it. Um, I give her so much credit. Uh, this is, this is an undertaking, like, you know, they, they say, okay, um, Andrea, um, okay, let's just go back to, like, Shawshank Redemption. If you've ever seen the Shawshank Redemption, you know how Andy's like, um, give me one of them little stone axes. And they're like, I don't want you putting a toe in somebody's head. And he's like, well, you'll, you know, when you see it, you'll know what I'm asking about. And he gets a little little hammer. It's about that big, right? You know, it's just that much. And, and he digs a whole tunnel. Yeah, right through the wall, and he gets out. And if I just spoiled it, well, I mean, sorry, this this movie's been out for years. Um, everybody knows the story, um, but it's like Andrea is given that rock hammer, and then told to go and mine gold all by herself, and the gold is two thousand feet below ground, and she starts in without breaking. But without batting an eye. She doesn't break a sweat. She doesn't bat an eye. She starts in, starts pounding on this mountainside. And piece by piece, chip by chip, she gets her way in and she strikes gold. The heart of gold. The mother load. The big vein. She gets it. Um, and she brings this story to life like nobody else. I can't see anybody. Anybody else. And I I, I know many, 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 many narrators out there. Um I just don't see anybody else being able to do this job by themselves, by themselves. Um, you know, I, that's one thing I, I love SBT, but SBT would have had like four narrators in the story and it would have been great. It would have been great uh, because they would have had like two men, two ladies, and they'd have switched off on voices and personality types and it would have been great. No, Andrea does it all by herself. And, I, like I say, I just don't know how she had the fortitude. I, I don't know how she didn't get hospitalized. Um, she drives this book like it is a semi on fire, and she's getting it away from a busload of school kids. I mean, it is. She's like a mad woman. She she just there's there's no fear. Like literally, there is no fear in her whatsoever. Um, she does this so incredibly well. It's scary. Now, with that being said. I have to say, like, my own personal preferences for the story. Um, the story is really good, but it's the characters and, that that make the story. And there's really, for me, three characters that I just absolutely loved and adored. Um, and they are Rags. Rags is just the best. I love Rags a lot because Rags doesn't really speak. And so you kind of have to get the stuff like, like that from Andrea to kind of get her attitude really right. And, you know, how she'll talk about like how they look at her or how she looks at other people um, and so on and so forth. All that attitude that she, you, you, you know she has is coming right from Andrea, right from Andrea. Another is Tor. Um, Tor is a skeleton who does not speak. Oh, what again? A nonverbal character? Are you kidding me? Are you, 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 yeah, no, I'm totally serious. Um, she makes a non, another non-verbal character. In this case, there is not even a mumble or a grumble or, meow, 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 that, you know, that she could make in response to uh, this character. There's just no way. Um, so she has to tell his story, you know, to her story, um, just by the intonation of her voice. And you totally get to her. You totally get him. You get where he's coming from, how he thinks, what he wants, what he doesn't understand. You get it all. You get it all. And of course, the third favorite uh, character is Kilbaketch. Uh, Kilbaketch is one of those rare, rare um, characters that it, it's kind of like charisma oozes from Kilbaketch the moment that he comes onto the page, or in this case, he begins playing in your ear. Um, Kilbaketch totally steals the show in my eyes for whatever he does. Um, he is just amazing. I love Kilbaketch and 
she infuses so much, like you say, heart into this character. It's scary. Now, you're going to say, well, didn't you like Aaron? Didn't you like, you know, well, I've told you how I feel about the runner. Aaron's good. She's nice. I liked, there's a Noel friend of hers, a Noel salesman. Like that 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 merchant a lot. Um, there's other characters, you know, like I said, Relk is okay. I'm not amazed by Relk, but I, he's a good character. The, the characters are all cool um, and, and they're fun and exciting. But like, if you want to go with narration and how impossible it would be to do some of this stuff. Like, I would love to see somebody else take a non-speaking character and make you feel the way that she makes you feel Tor is, okay? Or the way that Rags does things. Or this weird speaking insect, you know, as part of the Antinium, because the Antinium are a race of ant people that live under the city, and they basically struggle to... What they want, and I'm assuming, is they want to be able to have free-thinking individuals but remain part of the colony. But the problem is, is when they the moment they become free thinkers, they 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 snap and go, Oh, I'm an aberration, aberration, and they go killing everybody. So um the Ant- Antinium are, are just like this, they're very intriguing, and I like non-human void races. Um, you don't see very often insectile PCs, you know, uh, player characters or NPCs, whatever you want to call it, um, because it's just very difficult to get. They're very alien, very alien in their thoughts and processes, and that's where Pirate Abba really nails it down, because it's very clearly they are not thinking like people, but Andrea also makes them humanized. Um, Kill Catch very clearly, um, as inhuman as he is, um, it, it always makes me think of, you know, uh, Captain Kirk at the, the death of Spock. You know, and he goes, uh, of all the souls I've ever known, his was the most human. And and that's the way I see Kilbiketch. Um, Kilbiketch may be an ant, but he's he's very, very much more than that. Much more. And I'm not going to disgrace him by saying he's human, um, but he's got a lot going for him that... Um, you just don't see in characters very often. And, and, and that's that's the, the beauty of the book. The book has different races that have different attitudes that all work really well. Um, they're not negative or positives. Like, there's a, a nasty Drake that, you, you know, you're going to say he's a total dick. And then there's one that's really awesome. Um, then there's Relk, who's just kind of a neutral kind of guy. You know, he, he plays off like this or that, but he's neither good nor evil. Um the, the Knolls, you know, the Knolls start off very, very lashy out kind of people, but they, they come to accept Aaron and, and do things. So everything that she's like, there's a lot of world building and creature building. Uh, each race has different aspects about them that you don't see all the time. Uh, you know, that they that just kind of just pops up over a period of time. Really, really smart stuff. Um, I can't say how much I've enjoyed this book. Um, it's one of these things, like I say, I, I did 85 hours on a spaceship, and now I just live 40 hours in an end on a fantasy world. So, you know, I, I have spent some time amongst really great characters. Uh, and in this case, uh, I, I really can't wait to get back. I mean, it's, it's going to be hard to wait, but I know that Andrew is doing it. Uh, and Pirate Abba has 10 billion pages on Royal Road uh, that you can read for free. Uh, but if you want to, if you're like me and you need to wait for the audio, then by all means, just wait for the audio. Uh, I just don't know why it has to be so huge. Break it up. But the reason why I can see that the 40 hours is because there was a complete story arc in that 40 hours. Starts here and ends right here. Pretty clear, easy delineation. So, you know, I, I get it. But yeah, 40 hours is a long way for a book. I would have broken it up into two bits or something, but that's me. Um, I give Pirate Abba credit for not, not, um, you know, uh, breaking down and saying, oh, this is going to be too much. Nope. Pirate Abba said, this is where we start. This is where we end for the first book. Oh, my gosh. Every day I have fire trucks come by here. Um, I got to stop setting fires. Anyway, uh, Pirate Abba knows like, this is where the story needed to go and, and keeps it right there. And, and like I say, Andrea, man, she 
mines this for everything it is worth. And you know who the winner is? Is you, the listener. Uh, the listener just gets this amazing story on a platter handed to them. Um, and for one credit, I'm going to just say it right now, you know, there, there's a lot of times I, I flinch if I see a book's like five hours and they want one credit. I mean, you're talking like five hours for a single credit or there's even some books are like two and a half hours or three hours and they want a credit. I'm a little iffy on that. You know, like credits are not cheap and, you know, you, you have to kind of put it in perspective. Like, is it worth the money that I'm spending on this in comparison to what I could get otherwise. And just like I said with like Galaxy Outlaws, um, you get 85 hours, okay? And and maybe in 85 hours, there's there's a, a lull somewhere in that point. You know, you're like halfway mark. So 40 hours in, you kind of get a little, oh, the story is, you know, not going as quick as I, it should be. Um, here, you're getting 40 freaking hours of amazingness. Um, it is pure goodness, 40 hours of just blown away, never seen it before kind of stuff, even if you have seen it before. It feels really new, um, really fresh. Um, it's just incredible. And like I say, my hat is off to Andrea Parsonow because she is in freaking credible in the story. The writing, like I said, uh, it's A+. plus. The writing is A+. plus. The characters are A+. Plus. Um, I loved characters. I hated characters. Like I say, I hated the runner, but I liked her storyline. I, I really did. But I, I just don't know if I'll ever like her character. I don't know what goes next um, with her, but I'm hoping she she becomes a little bit less than what she is now and opens up more. Uh, and that's something to listen for, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm waiting and waiting. So um, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, who knows? Who knows? Um, and, and like I say, Andrea, man... Uh, Hats off, amazing story. So I don't even know how long I've rambled here, but I'm just going to say it like this. There's so much I could get into. Uh, it's just, there's so, I mean, there's just so much. It's, it's an incredible amount of story, an incredible amount of narration, an incredible, incredible amount of pure goodness and wholesome writing. I mean, it's just, it's all there. And, you know, it's something like my kids could totally listen to the story. There's not any sex. Um, the violence, it's there. But it, to me, violence is violence. I don't care if somebody gets their face sucked off by a big worm or not. I could care less. Could care less. Um, everything is there. I will let my kids listen to this very happily. And it's not a young adult story. Um, it's definitely not a young adult story. Uh, but it's just one of those things I think that anybody could pick it up and enjoy this story, no matter what where they're from, who they are. And that, that just says a lot unto itself. It just says a lot that I don't care what race you are, what economic background you fall from. I don't care, you know, what part of the, the world you're from. You're going to get this book and you're going to go holy guacamole. This was incredible. Incredible. And there's very few books like that. So my final score is... After a lot of deliberation, I mean, this is this is like a 9.5, 9.6. And a lot of it is just due to the amount of massive effort that I know that Andrea had to put into it. Um, because writing is nowhere near as hard sometimes as narrating. Writing is easy. I can say the guy speaks with a lisp. And then the narration has to say, this guy speaks with a lisp. And, you know, and then I have to make it sound like, okay, and then the swords clash, and they clang, and they stab, and they stab. Well, she, you know, they've got to make it sound exciting. And, you know, so right, I want to say writing is easy. Um, it's not. I know. I know it's not. Um, but there are points to this book you just go, Andrea made this seem effortless. And Pirate Abba made this story seem organic and natural. And so I'm going to say 9.6 stars. This is probably one of the most incredible books I've I've listened to. Um, and it's not Slice of Life. Not Slice of Life. I don't care what you say, I'll fight with, with you to the death on this. So 9.6 stars. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special Lit RPG audiobook podcast of narrations with 
Andrea Parsnow. And Andrea, I got your name right this time. So I'm good, right? Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about a few things. This is part of my wandering in special. Um, it, as a book like this, it, it needed a uh, very special focus put on it because this is an, an extremely long book and I know it had to be a grueling, not that it wasn't fun, but it had to have been <laughs> real work to get to this point. Um, and so it deserves to have a, a nice little focus on it. And what I want to do is I, I, you know, we talked about this a little while ago. Um, authors always get the focus put on them and that's great because they're the writers, you know, the, the people that create the books Absolutely. deserve to have it. But narrators, they're the ones that bring the book to life. And if a narrator doesn't do their job, a book can be great and it, it, it can be tanked by a horrible narrator in no time at all. So I think that, you know, really good narration is, is key in this business. And I, I really appreciate awesome narrators such as yourself. Um, and so, you know, bringing this out um, and, and making things happen, um, like I said, I just, I just think that, you know, I need to focus a little bit on the narrators from this point on. And so you are the perfect person to start with. Lovely, talented, brilliant. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you laugh at my jokes sometimes. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> so like I said, it was good. And then this is our, we're, we're almost breaking each other in because I've never done an interview and neither have you, so you say. Yep. So yep, I'll take your word for it. Okay. Uh, but you're, you're too polished to, uh, for me to believe that. But anyway. <laughs> I'm terrified. You haven't seen the fact that everything is just shredded paper down here. Just constant <laughs> shredded paper. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, we were talking a little bit earlier and, and one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, um, you know, I, I'm a latecomer to the genre. I mean, I was there when, when the big people were coming in, like William Rand and Blaze Corvin and James Hunter and, and, and so on and so forth. Their, their first books were coming out. But you were there even before I was, and you were like one of the early, early people into the, the genre. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to know was, what was it that, that pulled you in? What what caught your, your, your imagination, you know, so to speak, to make this genre stand out to you? Um, I was new to fantasy. That's a, a really strange thing to say, but I was, my first like real fantasy books that I had read were the Legends of Drist from R.A. Salvador. Oh yeah. And I've then I went, great. yeah, they're fantastic. And then I went to the Night Angel trilogy by Brent Weeks. And when I moved after that, Hayes, my husband Hayes had actually we'd inherited this huge library of all of these fantasy books that I had never really seen before. And I started pouring through them and it mm. was a while back now, but I started pouring through them piece by piece And the, I, these worlds started like, there's more to it than just something that's straightforward fiction, which is what I was reading before things like mysteries or thrillers or things right. like that. Right. And, um, uh, when I made the progression into lit RPG and I even read some of the, the Japanese light novels and stuff where they involved going into a game and living in a separate world, that fascinated me because some as coming from somebody who's not perfect physically, the idea of getting to be in a world where you can run on walls and, and defy gravity and, you know, curve bullets and, and be the hero that you, that I think most people want to be in their head. Mm -hmm. you know? right. <laughs> be the right. person that right. most people want to be. Mm -hmm. um, that was amazing to me. And so it was like, man, maybe someday this will be real. And I just got completely sucked into it. And SAO and finding the groups and all kinds of stuff later. That was it. <laughs> it's, okay. it's been a weird road. <laughs> yeah. But it's been a fun one, I'm sure. I mean, absolutely. You know, you know it, this this is one of the best communities in 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 the world. I mean, um, oh, they exactly are very, yeah, they're super supportive. I mean, I don't care who you are, what you do. Um, once you're in, you are in, you, you know, they take care of each other. Um, I, I love this community to death. I mean, I think that the people here are just, just fantastic. And, and you know, the nice thing is, is, is narrators and authors are very open and willing to speak to their fans. You know, I, I don't know how many times I've, like I said, I met, like you said, R.A. Salvatore. Um, and it was a very brief conversation. Like, thank you very much for coming. There's, you know, sign the book. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, most times that's what you get when you go to a convention, you get to sit down and talk to people. They're just moving along, getting the signatures and, and moving out. Um, but here you can sit down and have a full blown conversation with yourself or whoever, uh, you know, as long as you're being respectful, everybody listens and they respond. And, that, and that's why I say I like this, this genre a lot. So um, <clears throat> I was kind of curious as to how you kind of came into this. So my next question is going to be, you weren't originally a narrator, 
No. What brought you into that? How did you how did you fall into narration? Because it, it seems to me like it was kind of like right after you got into lit RPG, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, because some of the first uh, lit RPG books that I listened to were the first ones I listened to were by Jeff Hayes. And so I found out up to that point, my entire experience with audiobooks was Diablo 3 read by Scott Brick and a bunch of like standard fiction or self-help. I read I listened to a lot of like Jeffrey Kafer and stuff. So I was familiar with fiction or sci, uh, sci-fi, but the idea of really heavy character voices and like the idea that you can sound like multiple different people and stuff, that was absolutely amazing to me. So I transitioned into lit RPG from that. I fell into narration because I was in college for theater and I wanted to be a voice actor. And I found it was all kind of at the same time. I found, you know, Jeff Hayes doing what he was doing right about that same time. And I was like, wait a second, I don't have to live in L.A. But that that might be kind of cool. That would be really neat. And I could do these characters and stuff in the in in audiobooks instead. And then I can play all the characters. That'd be great. Cause then I know right. then I'm not just one. I want to try this. And, mm-hmm. you know, Will Arand actually was the one who had convinced me to go on ACX and take a look at what was there and and put samples up and start auditioning. Mm-hmm. And that was it was from there basically. It, I was encouraged by several people in the like every step of the way it's kind of been within lit rpg <laughs> as weird as that is to think about this this community i wouldn't be doing what i was doing without it legitimately right. i probably never i never would have found narration i never would have been interested in it it's just this is what i wanted to do oh no I'm, I'm so protective over it too <laughs> like i'm so protective over lit rpg <laughs> because of that i'm like no it's it's good the way it is <laughs> No, you're also, and there's nothing I hate more than like, you know, a narrator who comes in, it's like, you know, like an author who's right to market or a narrator who's just trying to jump in at the last possible second because they know, oh, we can make some money here. You know, that sort of thing. It it bothers me to no end when that happens because um, they, they, they don't care about the community and it's just more about how much can they get out of this. And I think the community is so much more, so much more. I think the community self polices on that front too, because I don't ever begrudge someone the ability to start, but you can tell when it's it's not genuine. Uh-huh. And I I've had this conversation, you know, multiple times with the people in my life that talking about what what has made, you know, what certain narrators have done in the genre more successful than what other narrators have done and stuff. And it it's multi leveled. But one of the simplest things it comes down to is knowing how to say, uh, quest complete, please run to X room and turn in because we know what that sounds like. We're gamers. We're part of that world. Whereas somebody else reads that and just goes, quest complete, turn to go there and run. And it doesn't sound right. It doesn't, it never does. But that's that it's little stuff. It's just immersion in the world, knowing where it comes from, and it being something that you really, truly love and enjoy, that that comes across from mm-hmm. the narrators that you can tell it comes across from. I'll put it that way. Right, right. No, I, I agree with you completely. Um, and one of the things I was kind of curious about, so when, when you were saying um, you, you tried out for ACX, um, was that how you got into Falling Out of Focus? Was That that was your first <laughs> book, right? Yes. Yeah, by Bryn Myers. Yep. yep. I told you I researched. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was my first book. Yeah, I actually did a, a special on Sound Booth Theater with that too. Jeff found out about it. Jeff, I had been talking to for months before that, and he was really excited when my first book came out because he had been talking me through getting started and stuff. And so when it first came out, he said, "Hey, why don't you come on Sound Booth Theater and, and we'll do a little a reading on there and stuff." So that was my first time on SBT too, was with Falling Out of Focus. Well, that's that's cool because you know that's one thing I, I really like about Jeff, and, and I've always said. Uh, and I made him swear this to me a long time ago when I first got into the community that if I die, I want him to read my obituary. Um, I, want, I want it recorded because I have a very special obituary written already. It's all set, <laughs> you know, and he's the only man alive that can do this. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Jeff is just amazing. And, and I think he's very, very supportive of other, other people when they come into this, you know. As, as he really is. He didn't need to give me the time of day. And being in the community now, in, in the narration community, at least the as much a part of that world as I can can be i'm not in i don't go to i can't afford to go to a ton of the events and stuff but 
go, being on it on Facebook and stuff, I've realized now this time later how rare it was for someone to take the time like that, for someone to actually stop being a successful narrator and go, sure, newbie, I'll help you out and walk you through every step of this process and tell you what equipment to buy and take valuable time out of my day to do this. Mm -hmm. Being in it now, I see how rare it is that people do that. And so I, right. Jeff was awesome to take the time with me that he did. Yeah, yeah. I, I have nothing but respect for him and, and, and Ramon mm -hmm. too. Because Ramon has been there. If I said, Ramon, I need help. Ramon's been like, pow, he's been on it. He said, here's what you got to do. We'll get this taken care of. No worries. You know, if something comes up, he's like, don't worry about it. We'll make it happen in another time, whatever. <laughs> you know, so, you know, they've been nothing but supportive for me. And, and you know, my big thing was going into this. Um, I probably said this before to you. Um, I'm, I'm one of those guys. I would do reviews for people out of my window. I'd be like, Hey, I read this great book, you know, and no one would listen because I'm just yelling at them. Um, but you know, I would write all these reviews for books that I loved and you know, they were like, well, try out for this. You know, Jeff literally texted me and said, try out for, you know, SBT's audiobook podcast. And I'm thinking, what the hell? I'm nearly 50 was, years old. I was hoping it would be you though. Uh, there were a bunch of us in the background that wanted it to be you so bad because your reviews, they were my favorites to read when I would go on to the, I'd go on to Audible and I'd be looking at my reviews and I'd be like, oh, Ray wrote a review. Yay. And that would be my favorite one to read. So when oh, they cool. announced the, the audiobook podcast, you know, auditions and stuff, I was just going, please, please, please. Come on, pick right, pick right. <laughs> yeah, well, I, really I was like blown that. away. Yeah, you know, I was. Well, I appreciate that. I really do, Andrea. <laughs> uh, because it was, it was not anything I expected. I thought they were going to say, "Thank you very much for trying." Uh, we will move along, and we have somebody else over here who's much more articulate. Uh, they, they, they read the books better than you. They listen. They have ears. Uh, the ears work, and so you know that sort of stuff. And I thought, no chance in hell. And then I got it. And I'm like. Well, now I got to actually do some work here. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to be easy. So, yeah, but like I said, the, the support, you know, like from them is just incredible. So I really understand what you're saying because neither one of them ever had to step up and say, you know, if you need help, do this or we'll help you here. You know, they didn't. And like you said, with, with you saying, you know, Jeff stepped up, he said, welcome, we're going to embrace you. And that's this community. You know, I keep, yeah. I keep harping on that, but that's the, the, the great thing about this community. Um, so, I think, if I'm not mistaken, your first lit RPG book was Travail Online. No, my first lit RPG was Dominion of Blades. Oh, really? Okay, yep. okay. That, I, that I was my first it. one. Well, that was a good one. I mean, man, you know, it was. It was. An, it still is. It's. It's got a such a close place to my heart. I absolutely love the Dob series. It's awesome. Well, Popper is probably one of my all-time favorite voices. That you, did. <laughs> you know, I, all I hear. Anything, anything goes wrong, I, I was, and forgive me, I'm going to swear here, but I was, anytime something goes wrong, I'm like, holy shit balls, you know? Like, yeah. it is you. Motherfucker, what the fuck am I supposed to do with that? Just the idea of a little kid with just a foul mouth and the attitude of just an angry ex-con was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was just, it was just fantastic. When I, I heard that book, I was like, my God. And, you know, and here's where I'm going to, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, And I, I know I've, probably written this to you a couple times or said something to you about this. Um, you're the reason why I can listen to female narrators because for a long time I had a massive bias. Um, you know, I don't want to say I was sexist, but I've, I've had audiobooks that were done by ladies that just, they did not know what they were doing. They just did not. Um, you know, they they didn't even come close to doing male voices, didn't, you know, put the inflections in or anything like that. It was just really, really hard for me to, you know, endure a lot of the work that they were doing and and, and then i'll even say kathy bates is one of the big ones you know award-winning actress kathy bates um she I've had never read, heard her narrate anything i haven't, I haven't well, seen it you are very <laughs> blessed you are very very blessed um and i can't remember which it was either silence of the lambs or you know something else but yeah, i think it was silence of the lambs um because I'd, I'd seen the movie read the book and i'm like well i've got to get the audio now and I was just so crushed. I was like, I, I can't do this. And then I had a couple other books where it was the same thing. And I said, well, I'll try this because, you know, this this is good. I like this book. And then they, they fobbled the ball. And, you know, <laughs> it, it was just so bad. Um, and then I, I heard you, and I think the first book I heard you do was Putera Online. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Maddie is like one of my favorite characters. I mean, like, you know. <laughs> Don Chapman can write a character to, to pieces and Maddie's like the best. And, and, you know, your narration brought that book to life. I was like, holy crap, this is, you know, 
doable. Like there, there's a, there's a lady out there who can read. And, and, you know, I've often said in my reviews, um, one of the things that really amazed me about you is the amount of motion that you pour into your stories. I mean, you know, not to blow smoke, but I mean, there have been times where um, like with Dan the Barbarian, uh, you know, the, the hobgoblin is is begging him, please. And I'm like, <laughs> do it, do it, I'm coming in there. You know, and, you know, and, and it's like that with and insomnia. I mean, there, there's so much things like I hear in your voice things that I know are not written in the text. And I have to wonder how much do you know? How much has KT Hannah told you, you know, about what's going on between the two, you know, sin and, you know, the main character and that sort of stuff. What's going on? You know, do you know everything more? Because you put so much into it, I can say, I think there's something happening here or happening here or happening here. And you did in all your books. Um, and I like to say, I'm that just the more than I can ever describe. Thank you. Well, you know, like I say, I'm just being, <laughs> if, if it was terrible, I'd say, I don't even want to do this interview anymore. I'm out of here, you know? So, uh, but no, I mean, you're just, it's incredible. <laughs> it, it's just incredible. Um, so, you know, you, you can't have a favorite, but, but like I say, with me, like Maddie was there, Popper's there. You, you've got so many characters um, who are some of the ones you enjoyed, even if you want to bring in the wandering in at this point and say, like, who are some of your characters that you enjoyed from there? Uh, that I've enjoyed voicing? Yes. It's typically it's typically the ones that are kind of off the wall. It, that's almost always who it is. Um, it's, it's like the Zeeks from Dan the Barbarian and Popper from uh, Dominion of Blades. Or like there's there's always those kinds of characters where they're kind of off the wall or or nutty a little bit and they they settle in like um it's it's like any movie or TV show everybody likes playing the villains you know because mm -hmm. they're the most interesting they're the most colorfully written they're the most over the top because main characters are typically you know designed to be something relatable so that you can put yourself in that position and experience that story yourself mm -hmm. so. Those characters are very frequently, they need to be calmer characters. They need to be the ones who are the relatable, you know, you know, stoic, standard people that you can follow along and say, yes, I totally relate to this guy. Whereas those peripheral characters can be nuts and they're amazing. You know, they can be a lot right. more colorful and a lot more varied. And uh, that's that's a lot of fun. And it has to do with, you know, how much dialogue there is for those characters, too. That right. get a little rough. Yeah, but, yeah. But yeah, there's been a ton of them that I've really enjoyed. Kilbukic was really fun uh, because he had such a unique accent to him. Mm -hmm. uh, Relk was a lot of fun. But honestly, the most fun I think I had with just a character in general was Pisces. Pisces is a blast because okay. of just, he's over the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know exactly what you're saying. But yeah, Kilbukic, um, in the book, I've got three really favorite characters and two of them... Uh, you they don't really have speaking parts but you bring them to life even without speaking you bring them to life you know um a uh, tour the 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 skeleton, skeleton. and and rags the, the little goblin oh your you know, rags is amazing <laughs> yeah i love and kill the catch of course is my one of my favorites um too um but i don't know how you did that because it's kill the catch i don't know how you can talk like that kill and not blow yeah. <laughs> yeah everything was kill the catch or we are doing that me. It was everything had to be popped and trilled. It was weird. It took a lot of takes. I can't do it off the cuff because it takes a lot of like practicing to get it through again. Because mm. everything that was an uh or oh, uh, those were both, and then were pop noises for anything that was a hard K sound or a C sound. Right. That was that was weird. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. They said that they spoke with trills and pops in the book. So I didn't have any like the the author didn't want me to do anything specific with it they didn't have anything that they wanted done so i just i got to run with it and that's what i did i had the descriptions from the text so i got to do what i wanted with it <laughs> so, and i enjoyed myself yeah, i bet i bet and, and, and that's you know um the book is really great i mean I, i'll go into that real quick here um i really enjoyed the book a lot i mean it, it, it was really fantastic and you you had a lot to do with it because i'll, I'll be honest with you um there's two main characters and the one is really, really great. And the other, 
I just wanted to, to punch in the head every time she did something because uh, she just did everything wrong and she just did it the wrong way every single time. And I'm like, ah, I can't take this girl. You know, Ryoka just just drove me crazy. This is the funniest thing to me is everybody has the opinion of I well, not everybody, everybody who liked the book. It's it's almost always I loved one of the MCs and I hated one of the other ones or the I hated the other one. And it's always, you cannot guess which one it's going to be because right. the person will go, Aaron's such an idiot. She did everything wrong. And Ryoka was at least grounded and, and reasonable. And then the next person will go, what are you talking about? Ryoka was a total bitch. And she was, she was horrible. And yeah. Aaron was at least realistic. Like you'll, it's, it's, it's uh, very polarizing for how much, right. how different those two characters were. I agree. And, and, and I'll be honest with you. Um, as I listen to it, um, and, and that's a whole miracle unto itself. I'll have to talk about some other time. Um, I kept saying to myself, this is either a character that you're going to love or you're going to hate. And it went both ways. And, you know, like you said, for me, Aaron, she was very real. Like everything she did would probably be something my stupid butt would be doing, you know, like walking through the woods, not thinking about it, grabbing fruit off the trees and, oh, this is <laughs> edible, you know, whatever. I would do all that stupid stuff just like she would. Um, whereas Ryoka, she was very very distancing. And I think that, that that distancing from other people also, for me, read into the reader. You know, she was keeping away from us too. You know, she's like, stay back. You're not getting any closer. I'm not letting you in on anything. And and again, that's really good writing because as much as I hated her, I enjoyed her story as much. I just wanted to smack her in the head. You know, <laughs> that's all there was to it. Um, and, you know, and I can't ask you, like, you know, how did you 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 feel about these characters yourself? Because I don't want you to put you on a spot. But, <laughs> so so what I'll do is I'll ask because um, you've already said you really like doing Relk and and you know, kill the catch and stuff. What exactly was it that made you want to do this book in the first place? Had you read any of the Wandering In uh, before you had gotten the opportunity? Yes, and I'd been chasing. This is the funniest part. I'd been chasing that book for a year. Like I had wanted to do the Wandering In when it was on Royal Road. I'd read through. Uh, what would be half of the volume of the first volume? And I was like, this is an amazing story. This is unbelievably written. I want to do this. And so in August of the year before it got published, it was the year before it got published. I wrote to Pirate Abba on Royal Road and they responded and said, I'm not really doing anything with the publishing. I'm not going to, I'm not going to edit it for publishing or audio. So thank you. I appreciate the offer. You can use it on, you know, a stream or YouTube, what you want to do with it for fan stuff, but I'm really not doing anything professionally with it. And I was like, okay, that I totally understand, you know, and we had about two or three more interactions um, just back and forth. I think it was two more after that. We had three total. They were just kind of back and forth, me checking on them, seeing if they just, they changed their mind on it, see if they wanted to do it. And no, no, I'm, I don't think we're going to do that. And so I went, okay. So the last time I talked to him, I, to them, I have no idea if they're male or female. Everybody asks me that. I have no idea. <laughs> um, they, I spoke to them and basically said, I see that you've published. It was right after they had published it and they had published on Amazon. And I said, I see you've published. If you have any interest in doing audio, let me know. I would be happy to help you with it, you know, and just let me know. That one went unanswered more than likely because right around that same time, <laughs> Podium was talking to them. And so Podium, six months later, contacted me and said, hey, we've got this really cool book we want you to want to work with you on, but it's really long. And I answered and I said, what, what is it? And they said, it's the wandering in. And I'm like, are you finally, <laughs> finally, I'm going to get to do this book. Uh -huh. So I had been pushing for that book for over, over a year at that point. So, and I, I know that there were, it, it was, it was a want, like a bunch of people wanted that in audio. So there were a bunch of us trying to get them to do audio for it. Yeah, me. I mean, like, you know, I, I, I hate to sound like this. I, I don't have time to read. Like, no, literally, I, literally I was putting my kids to bed and I was reading them um, The Witch Who Saved Halloween. And that's the only time I have to read is when I'm putting children to bed. And usually it's Harry Potter or, you know, something, yeah. <laughs> something like that. So, you know, it, otherwise it's audio for me. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of books out there. I miss out because they're not in the audio format. And, you know, and I know a lot of narrators who were kind of miffed at, you know, you got this because a lot of people, 
you know, just just to be frank about it, you know, there's some jealous people out there right now um, because <laughs> this this thing is blown up. I mean, the, the book is huge. I mean, it, it's, it's gotten a, a bigger than expected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been it's been bigger than I thought it would be. It's been a little bit intimidating, to be completely honest. Right. Well, you know, I, I give you a lot of credit because you know, I, I don't know if, if you, you I've talked to you about this or not. I, I probably mentioned it. Um, I I once had an audio book that was like 87 hours that I listened to. And it was, it was a really good book really because it was like 16 books all in one. It was a series. And, you know, by the time I got done with it, I was like, I know these people I've lived with them. I've been on a spaceship with them. I, you know, I could tell you everything about their lives. And when it was done, it was almost like the weight was off my shoulder because it was completed. And, and I was like, wow, it was, it was worth it. But I don't know if I could go through, 87 hours of a book again. I mean, I really don't. And then when I saw that, the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, so when I saw that you had like this 40 hour plus book, I'm like, oh my God, you know, I, you know, it's Andrea. So I have to listen to it. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's, it's 40 plus hours. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. The hours went by like this. I mean, I, I listened to it and it was in no time. I probably had it done in just three days. So, um, but we were really busy. And so I was always in the car or doing something or, you know, other things I can't talk about on air. Um, but it was, it was just, uh, one of those things I was, I was always listening. So I got to go through it really fast and it was just very enjoyable. And I, I thought, my gosh, uh, you really put in the time and effort to make this perfect because I don't think I caught a glitch, uh, in the story to be frank. Um, you know, there's times I'll hear like, you know, narrators will, will say something two or three times and it's, you know, they'll repeat a sentence here or there. Oh, yeah. Double yeah I, I don't get that here. You know, I didn't hear you flub anything. I was like, you know, you, you put the time and effort and the care into it. And I know that you did not rush it because I can remember when you were just getting uh, the book itself, you know, it was a long time from the time you said, Hey, I've got the wandering in and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm doing this before it was completed. And I was like, yeah, there was a lot of time. How long exactly did that take you to, to record? To record it? Two months. It took me two months to actually record it. Um, I was scheduled out pretty far when they contacted me. And so I I had to push it forward a little, um, probably three three months or something like that. I, I couldn't schedule it for like three months. And I started it in the very beginning of May. Was the very beginning of May? Something like that. And then I was done by the end of June. So it was two months. Um, but it was almost straight. At the time, I was trying to juggle doing another book at the same time, and it didn't work out. I was trying to figure out how to juggle because that's its own issue, its own scheduling problem for a narrator to have a book that long because it's other books, especially if you if you work in lit RPG and stuff you or harem, you know how fast the books come out. Like right. there's a huge release schedule for books. Mm -hmm. And so there are books piling up in the background while you're working on it and you're desperately trying to get things done. So I tried to do two books at the same time and it failed miserably. My voice would be too tired to record the one book and then it would be too exhausted the next day because I, I was able to do three hours this day, but then the next day it'd be completely out and it was just it was a mess. So I learned that lesson doing it, that it needs to just be dedicated time. And that would probably speed it up a little bit more too. Yeah. But, but yeah, it was, it took a long time to record. And as far as I have to say this, as far as no glitches or double takes or anything like that, I do do punch and roll when <laughs> do do, I do punch and roll while recording, but uh. <laughs> I'm a child, but, uh, so I shouldn't be sending over anything that's a double take or anything to the editor, but there cannot be enough credit given to our editors and proofers. As narrators, we have editors and proofers that have our backs so unbelievably that they catch it when you say dookie rather than dutchy. dutchy. <laughs> you blew it. I was going to ask that question later. <laughs> I'm so sorry for blowing the surprise. Yes. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll skip it now. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that will haunt me forever. So that I was still proofing my own stuff. Don't proof your own. Don't ever proof your own stuff. So our proofers have our backs and the editors make us sound good. And the team at podium is amazing. So, I mean, they're, they're absolutely phenomenal. So there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that go into the production of these books and on a book that long, Oh man, 
I, I probably had one of the easier jobs in that process, man. That would be a lot. That's a lot to master and edit and everything. They're phenomenal there. Yeah. Well, I, I give editors a lot of credit because I mean, I, I don't know the process, but I know what they go through. That You have to listen, re-listen, you know, make sure everything is exactly right. Did we miss something? Are we missing paragraphs or, you know, did we skip this or that? You know, it's like film, you know, a, a good editor can put together a, a horrible, a horrible movie and make it fantastic by editing. Um, with sound, they, they can do the same thing. You know, you can, you can chop it up however you want to as a narrator. And as long as you've got your lines down, they can put it together and make it sound like it was flowing perfectly. So yeah, I give them a lot of credit, you know, and that's, that's one thing I will say that uh, <clears throat> you're, you're absolutely a spot on with is the editors deserve a lot of the accolades, but yeah. again, you know, th they're the behind the scenes people and you know, you're the face, you know, you're the voice. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so I have to ask them, um, with, with the voice you, you were wanting, cause you, you had said, and it was one of those things I've always wondered. And, and Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying here because I don't want you to leave lit RPG. But why are you, why aren't you why aren't you like doing uh, animation voices? Why aren't you like you know doing stuff? Because you would kill. I mean, like you would be a great animated voice in movies and things. Uh, I don't live in LA. Yeah. Both movies and uh, animation for any of the major studios, as well as uh, anything with AAA video games. Those are both completely based out of LA. You have to actually go into studio. We haven't reached the point at this point yet where we can do at home animation audio or in Austin. Uh, Funimation is based out of Austin. So technically, if you live in Austin, you could do anime work if you are so inclined to train that skill. But um, yeah, it's, it's almost all Austin and LA. I think I think Lori Winkle does some stuff in Atlanta, but I think hers is on camera more than animation. Animation knows almost all in LA and Austin. Okay. Okay. Now I was just curious. Cause like I said, with your talent, I mean, you, you would just crush. I mean, you Thank know, you. You, you, you would do cartoons cause you, you, you have a very versatile voice and you. You, you can do male and female, um, you know, and, and crazy and, and you can do serious, <laughs> you know, there, there's, like I said, when I, I was re listening to, um, Harmon Cooper's Apocalypse book. I kept thinking, how can she play like the stoner and then the other, you know, there, there's two totally different philosophies here. How how do you get yourself into that headset to be able to do that? <laughs> you know? It's it's a weird um I I may not I I like I pride myself on having that ability, like that that I will commit to it. I will commit to the character, even if it is wrong. I will commit to the character. Um, I do it when I'm playing tabletop role playing games with my husband and Scott's too. Like I'll be talking to a dragon as a dwarf, and I start crying because my character's scared out of her mind, and I'm I'm crying and sobbing, beseeching the dragon, and Hayes is sitting there in his chair, just going, <laughs> "Yeah, like it's." Yeah, this is I'm killing this. This is amazing. Like it's yes, it's it, that dropping into a character and making a fool out of myself hasn't really ever been difficult for me, but sometimes like finding the character, maintaining the accent, uh connecting to that, that that part's difficult. You know, maintaining the, the vocal part is can be difficult, but the headspace of a character, the the knowing what they would think or do. Mm -hmm. I may not have the biggest vocal range. I may not have, there's, there's other things that I'm far weaker in that part. I like doing that part. I know I'm good at is kind of figuring out the headspace of a character and what they do. Cause I think about it a lot. That's mm -hmm. one of the big things that I talk through on my stream is okay. But she just came out of this. So I don't think she'd be this excited about it yet. I feel there should be more apprehension to this. Mm -hmm. I'll sit there for 20 minutes thinking out that stuff. So it, it's well, it translates. I mean, it translates in into the book. I mean, like I said, I, I think really, and I'll say it as as clear as I can. I think your work on Somnia Online is probably some of the most emotional. Uh, it's powerful. I mean, I, I listen to it, and, you know, and, and I can feel like the emotions and 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 the things that people are going through, uh, whether it's sin or you know, I mean, like everybody has things that's happening, and and there are definitely issues that everybody has and you bring all of that forth <laughs> very easily it seems um and, and you know and i give you a lot of credit because you very obviously think things through and say 
you know, where is this person at at this point in time? You know, what would I do if I were in their place? How would I feel? I, I get that a lot. And like I said, I don't know, you know, and don't, you don't have to say anything if you don't want to, but, you know, how much did KT Anna say to you, you know, these people have this kind of relationship. There's this kind of relationship with these people. Um, they're going through this. Or do you just suss it out as you go through the readings? You know? um, 99, like 99% of it, I suss out. Katie and I went over um, some stuff before Somnia 1. Um, not the stuff you are thinking of, because I think I know what you're thinking of. Not that. Uh, mm -hmm. That that actually came later, if I remember her. She talked to me about it. and That, that kind of came later. Um, but... It, it was more like we have conversations kind of after the book because she likes to hear my reaction of it, too. She likes to hear what I thought of it and what I got out of it, too. Mm -hmm. If there's really important stuff, she will share and she'll tell me what's going on or, or these people need to kind of have this feel just because this may go on in the future. But she's her characters live in their world. So when I read it, I've never I've never really had trouble pulling what the characters are going through or, or how they feel from her stories just because they feel so much a part of the world they are in you know they they yeah. live and breathe in that environment and that's that comes through in her writing so i've never had trouble finding you know this person's relationship with this person or these people seem kind of rough with each other or anything like that because it's just it's there you can well yeah they're, they're very real they're they're well fleshed out yeah. i mean i guess i give her a lot of credit as a writer because um you know you, you read her stuff and and there, there's no question it's all laid out as plain as it can be you know they are who they are uh mm -hmm. and you, you bring that to life you know really really well and i, I respect that a lot um but i'm gonna back up a little bit because i had a question and you were talking about dominion of blades um in that series there's a very special guest in that series that you yes. <laughs> how, did, how did Hayes get involved in that? Can I ask? He was in uh, Binding Words too. He was in the second Binding Words book. He played a, a werewolf in that one, and he was also in Travail. He played two gods in Travail. Um, he he is my absolute lifeline when there is a voice that I just. I can't do justice to, I can't, I feel like I am going to do the book a disservice by not using a, a male voice that can do a voice that I can't do. Mm -hmm. And there is an element of he can safely do a voice that really genuinely risks hurting my voice if I mm -hmm. do it too much. <laughs> right, no, I get it. Yeah. So yeah. he, I'll pull him in and it's, I, I I I both want this known and not want this. I cannot do an Australian accent to save my life. I cannot. I cannot. Okay. Do not ask me to. If you have it in your book, your character's not getting an Australian accent at this point. They will sound like they had a stroke. It is okay. awful. You're going to become Austrian, uh, Austrian is what you're saying? Yes. It's it's like if an Austrian and a Cockney person had a, had had another person, They someone grew up and then that person didn't know how to talk. That's how my Australian accent sounds. It's terrible. Fair so, enough. Hayes had a good one. Hey, Hayes has a great like bogan Australian accent, just that country Australian accent. And it was perfect for Oliver, the little dude, the beast master. So, and he was bingo and he did a great job as bingo. So. Yes, that's my, he is my lifeline when it comes to characters that I just don't feel doing justice to. He would have been King of Destruction in uh, The Wandering Inn if it wouldn't have been through Podium. Because it was through Podium, I didn't have the the right to bring him in. But if it, if it would have been me alone, I would have had him do that. Because that, that character was terrifying to me. And it was a whole chapter of yelling <laughs> in right. that really loud gravelly voice mm -hmm. yeah no I, I understand and plus he i guess he works for cheap right i mean yeah yeah cookies <laughs> mainly <laughs> me too i work for <laughs> jeff Hayes has me a box every couple months and i'm good you know <laughs> i mean reviews you get there's there's an oreo and a chocolate chip and yeah so no i work for <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how, how you know, because I don't think my wife would ever do something like that. If I said, come down and be on the show with me, she'd be like, no, I'm not going to do it. So I don't know how you, you could talk him into doing that because my wife would not do it. My kids, yeah. Like when I do the dungeon, <laughs> I'm 
coming up soon. My kids have already said, we're going to be there. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And I'm like, great kids. But my <laughs> wife never, never, because she, she, I, I love my wife and I'm going to just say it as gently as I can. She is not a big fan of lit RPG because of the tables. Um, she's great. Like she loved the bathrobe night. Um, but it, it wasn't like, you know, great big, huge table after table after table. Mm -hmm. And I'll be listening to the books and they're like, you know, dexterity here and wisdom here and this and that and yeah. the other thing. And she's like, how, how do you do this? And she's like, I would fail this book. Just give it a pass because I can't, I can't, uh, you know, can't connect with that at all in my head, how you can do that. So, you know, I, I respect it. He's willing to come out and help out when you need, you know, you need he's to. another voice actor. So it worked out when I started doing this, he doesn't, <clears throat> his voice is really intense to hold for an entire narration book. Like it would be exhausting to listen to. That's why he doesn't want to narrate. And also he doesn't have the patience for it. He's a voice actor. He likes voice acting. He was, uh, he was Dr. Doom and an offshoot Marvel thing and stuff. And uh, he, did I just make an idiot? Is Doc, Dr. Doom's Marvel, right? Yes, he is. Oh, thank God. Okay. I was making sure I didn't say something stupid just now. Um, but he, he was already a voice actor like long before I was. So when I started doing this, he let me know, you know, if there is any rough stuff, if you ever need any help, I'm totally down to help you out. But he won't narrate to say, but he can't, he can't, he hates it. Yeah. <laughs> he hates narrating. He likes listening to the audio books. Yeah, fair enough. Now, do you, do you <laughs> like, like I, I'll ask, I, I know that at one time, um, you were probably just throwing out there your net when you were getting started and catching whenever you could, because, you know, you, you had done like a paranormal romance book and then something oh, else. Yeah. Can't remember. Um, but now do you like read the books before you go into it? Or do you have like, where you just say, okay, I know the characters cause I've talked to the, the author. Uh, how do you prepare to, you know, because I don't know, I, I would have to read the books to see, you know, from start to finish. So that I would know the character growth and changes and that sort of thing. But how do you, you prepare for that? Oh, for before I start recording? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I always prep the book. I read the book through. Um, I don't do the real heavy script markup. There's a lot of narrators that will go through and like mark breaths and mark tone changes and all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they'll mark tone changes and, and everything about it. They'll highlight different characters in different colors of highlighter and stuff. They do a, a ton of script work. I don't I don't go through that. I don't mm. go that far. I just uh, prep through. I read through the book. I will gather pronunciations that worry me that I'm not sure that I'll know. And then I send those off to the author because like uh, Somnia has new pronunciations and new names every single book. Same mm. thing with finding words. Um, Daniel is in stream a lot. So he's um, around almost the whole time or right around the whole time when I'm recording one of his books. So he's a little bit easier in that front or not easier but more accessible on that front he's around so i don't have to prep the list before i start typically he's there so he can answer questions as i go um but there's all there's all different kind of ways to prep that different narrators use but mine is just i prep through the book i read through it i get feelings for what i want to do for the characters typically in the first quarter of a book i know how people sound in my head like mm -hmm. that's just what they sound like to me and that's what i'll do Right. And that's it. No, I, I understand that. Um, you know, and I think it, the, as talented as you are, you don't have to go through all the little markups and write-ups, you know, because you kind of have this innate feeling, I think, that you can say, okay, I know this is where this has to happen, and this is the way they should be doing things. So I give you a lot of credit on that. Um, oh, no. Don't thank me. I'm just telling it like it is. <laughs> well, I feel like my, my theory on it was – if I go through and mark it up on my first read through, I don't know that I'm not going to feel differently about it after I've already finished the book. So when I'm going back through it, those markings may not hold the same meaning for me because mm -hmm. of something that happened at the end of the book that makes me change how I view this scene now. So right. I, I like to let the book grow with me while I experience it at the same time. Yep, that makes sense. I mean, like, I'll be honest with you, 99% of the time when I'm reading to my kids, because um, I do voices and everything like that, and, and like, I've always wanted to do narration, but um, neither here nor there. But anyway, um, I've always read books to them that I've read many times. So mm -hmm. I know I can get to the end of the page before I even turn it. I can tell you what they're going to say <laughs> the next thing. So I can keep going. I'm like, how do you know what they're, you know, what they're going to say before you get to the next? Because I've read these books so <laughs> many times, you know, that I know what they're going to say and how they're going to react and stuff like that. So I can do, you know, the, the different things and, and, and keep up with it. Um, 
so I, I totally get that. I, I really do. You know, I think reading through is probably the smartest thing you can do. I, I don't know how you, I, I know there are narrators who do this, but I don't know how you could come into a cold and just set to reading, but you can tell to me, there's a lot of times I can tell a narrator just kind of just came into the book, opened the first page, or I guess you guys use those electronic screens, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> You're not four pages anymore. That's, that's old school. See how old I am. Um, you know, <laughs> But you know you're you're scan, you know, flipping through the 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 the, the Kindle or whatever you use, or or iPad, and you know just starting to read as they go, and that's just how, how it is. You know, there's there's a lot of them like that. So I give I give you a lot of credit because you're putting in the time to do the reading, and and so is that how you kind of pick your books too? Like you you pick up a book and you say, I really like this book, and I'll see if they want to, you know, or yeah, answer it. Yeah. It depends on the the situation, honestly. Like every book, kind of come, it, they've all come to me in different ways. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Will, I was friends with when I first started out, so he and I kind of I started working on his Randy Darren stories, mm -hmm. and then it just grew from there. And KT approached me. Um, Don had approached me. I approached uh, Brian Simons for Travail. I approached Hondo. Um, I can't remember. I think Daniel and I had been kind of encouraged to talk to each other. Like, I think that, I think that Will had told Daniel to talk to me and Will had told me to talk to Daniel. So then we, we hooked up to talk about his. So I, it's all, they've all kind of different, they have different origins, but at this point I'm kind of working for the most part with the same people. Oh, Harmon, uh, Harmon, I knew basically through the community and he approached me about star spangled apocalypse and then okay. uh death's mantle this year um but yeah they're all kind of at this point just people that i know as weird as that sounds like i i know they're the our community is amazing you know people are accessible these authors are are people you know and they're they're accessible they'll talk to you about their books they're passionate they're interesting to talk to and so you just kind of get to know them, which makes it a million times harder when you are busy and don't have a schedule, don't have time in a schedule to do a book for somebody that you absolutely adore that you would love to work with otherwise. Um, but at this point, most of the time, it's just people that I know that I talk to and go, yeah, I'd love to connect with you over this. I I'd love to do a book with you at some point, you know, well, I, I think it either works out or not. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I think, honestly, I think you've hit most of the major players, honestly, um, in Lit RPG. I can only think of maybe a handful right off the top of my head that I don't think you've worked with. <laughs> and I might be wrong, but I, I think, like, honestly, I think the only names I can think of would be like um, Dakota Kraut or James Hunter, because everybody else, I think you've got William Moran, you've got Blaze Corvin, uh, Daniel Shinofen, uh, you know, you, you, you could go on and name all the people, but I'm just saying for the Lit RPG community, I, mean, I think you've gotten ninety nine percent. You you worked with them <laughs> along the line, you know. And even with that, so many amazing authors in our community. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and like I say, what really amazes me with you is is you've also worked with SBT on books, and you know, and you're mm -hmm. not a, uh, you're you're not a prime time player for them. You're kind of just coming in as a as a special guest, which is is really fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's a surprise. I always love to see it when you just pop up out of nowhere. I'm like. Oh, there's Andrea's name. Okay. <laughs> you know? um, so how, how did, how did like, cause you've done a few things with SBT recently. Mm -hmm. How did all that come into play uh, for you? That's the funniest thing. Jeff had asked me to work with SBT back when he was um, starting to do the multicast thing, when he wanted to switch over into multicast mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, he had asked me to join on and uh, do a book with him. And I panicked. Because I was Jeff, if nobody, if somebody doesn't know this, Jeff is superhuman. Like he is an unbelievably efficient narrator. He doesn't make the same mistakes. He remembers characters immaculately. Like he is an unbelievably talented guy. Mm -hmm. And I require different, I am slower. I am anal retentive. I have to keep notes and records and I can't turn out as much audio as he can. So even today I can't. So I kind of freaked out and was like, no, there's no way. I'm not going to be able to keep up with you. I'm going to end up dragging the company down and I'm going to, I'm going to ruin everything. And also I didn't, I, I didn't, I also wanted to be me. I was so afraid of becoming something else. I didn't want to be, you know, 
under under Jeff's wing because he was such a powerhouse. You know, he's so good that I didn't want to be stuck underneath him in his shadow, you know? So right. I wanted to try to make it on my own so that I could prove to myself that I could do it, that I wasn't just, he had already helped me so much. I didn't want it to be, oh yeah, and I'm successful because Jeff let me into sound booth, you know? So he he's such an unbelievable force in the industry and he's so incredibly kind and giving. The last thing I ever wanted to do was just piggyback myself off of him. You know, mm -hmm. that that's my worst nightmare. So I insisted on being completely independent for years. I was like, I won't work. I don't want to work with anybody. I don't want to, I don't want to hook my wagon to anybody else's train. You know, I want to make sure that I can do this, that I'm not risking somebody else's career because I do something wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's, that neuroses is the genuine reason. <laughs> like I'm so scared of messing up somebody else's stuff, somebody else's deadline, somebody else's career. So I, freaked out for a long time about it wouldn't work with anybody and then slowly but surely um i've started branching out from it jeff asked me about it the at the beginning of the year uh right before here now and uh it was it was well before here now actually it was probably in february and he said hey would you consider finally working with sbt and he's like i i'll i'll take care of everything it'll be fine you know we'll I would love to have you do character voices for us. And I said, okay, all right. I'm, I'm me now. I'm me, you know, I'm not, I'm not anybody else. I don't have to worry about, you know, freaking out because I, I took advantage of somebody or I, I messed something up for somebody. I'm just me. And mm -hmm. I, I'm confident enough and competent enough at this point that I was like, all right, I think I can do this. I, I think mm -hmm. I'm all right with working with with somebody else now. And that was kind of the beginning. I worked with Jeff and or with Sound Booth, and then I worked with Podium, and now I'm working with somebody with uh, uh, Chris Graves on Sketch. Oh, Chris and is awesome, by the way. He's amazing. He's I I absolutely adore that guy. He's so cool. And um, there's somebody else. I think I'm missing something. But anyway, I don't remember at this point. Oh, uh, it's, and somebody else, but there, that's not a thing yet. So um, you can cut that part out because that made no sense. I was <laughs> trying to remember something. <laughs> Please we'll leave it in just for kicks. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. Anyway, that's the whole thing. It's it basically that I wanted, I wanted to work with other people. This is a very isolating job. It's a very like kind of a lonely thing. So I eventually wanted to try acting with other people and seeing what it was like to act off of other people and do multicast because it's a totally different thing. It was a huge opportunity. So I was like, yeah, I, I, I do want to try this. This would be great. Well, I'm glad you did because, you know, I understand, you know, you kind of had to get your narration legs and where you could feel like you were able to stand on your own. You, you had done your time, you had proven yourself. And after you do that, then you can say, okay, now I can play with the other people because yeah. I know what I'm doing, you know? And then that's just, that's just wisdom right there because, you know, if you just, you're starting out and you say, Hey, I want to run with the big dogs. You yeah. usually you get bit, you know, and, and, it, and it happens like that. So, I mean, I, I think that you, you, you played it pretty smart. Um, and I think everybody here knows how professional and amazing you are with things. So, <laughs> Oh no, stop it. Stop it. Um, you know, but, uh, you, you just, like I say, you elevate everything that you touch. I, I, I could almost say you could take like some fifth grader story and read it. And then it would be like a college level. <laughs> yeah you know andrea could do that she could she could do that easily so um, um one of the things i wanted to go back to because you were talking about it and i meant to ask see I, i'm i'm scatterbrained so i'll jump around here and there um you said it had taken pretty much two months solid to do the wandering in how how long does it actually take you to do a regular 12 or 13 hour book um how, how, how long does it usually take to complete it depends because it depends on how much dialogue there is versus how much narration. I found that's the biggest indicating factor for me as to how quick a book is going to go. Um, it, it all really depends. Typically, I I record about an hour and a half a day. So I fin finished audio. I get about an hour and a half done per day unless it's, <clears throat> excuse me, unless it's super heavy dialogue. If it's all dialogue, like a lot of Will's books are where they're just 
you're jumping between seven different characters. Daniels are like that too, where it's all just person, 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 like all the way through. And they're all different emotions and all different types of people. Those are exhausting vocally. So those I will, you, I can burn out after an hour. I've right. had days where 45 minutes took me four hours and I just right. was burnt at the end of it. But for the most part that I can crank out between an hour and a half and two hours a day, I can push it up to two and a half or three if I have, if I absolutely have to, if it's a real heavy dialogue book. But I don't like doing that because I feel like that does a disservice to the book because I'm not able to give it as much, like as much care. You know, I just don't, mm -hmm. I don't like prefer doing that. So. No, no. And I get that because I'm sure like changing your voice back and forth, you know, you, 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 you talk, you know, I went to the store and there was this other guy and then we, we thought, and then I did this and then and you go through this whole thing. You're, you're, you're racking your throat to pieces. So yeah, it's yeah. exhausting. And females yeah. have a, a little bit more fragile of a voice on that front. Our voices tend to fatigue faster. So it makes it a, a little bit tough when it's specifically characters like that. Oh, really? Mm. Characters like this, like the really airy characters? Mm -hmm. Oh, these will burn you out so fast. Whispering is actually really terrible for your voice. But like that's whispering is really, really rough because it just it's a sandpaper to your sinuses and your throat. So those voices that are like this, like Wolfga and stuff, uh -huh. those are actually easier to do than the ones that are real voicey like those ones. Those those will burn me real quick. Right. Yeah. No, I, yeah. Yeah, I understand that because I, I think I, I told Lavelle Jackson, I said, you know, uh, and it's in my, my review, so I'm not going to spoil anything, but he did he did that book far enough. And I said, one of the things I was really disappointed with the narration was the narrator did not try in the slightest to make it an animalistic voice, you know, and he's like, well, you know, uh, I think his response was, is, you know, that, that has to hurt after a while. And I'm like, Lavelle, I could talk like this all day. I can talk forever. <laughs> I can go deeper. I can make it growly. I can talk like this forever because when I was a kid, that was my super monster voice. And I talk like that all day long. You yeah. Know, so I, I could do that without breaking a sweat and never have my throat grow raw. Um, but if I talk like this, then my yeah. voice, you know, it, it, it won't do it, you know. So I can understand, you know, exactly what you're saying. But, you know, th that's where I say you, you have to know the, the character a lot. And that's where I say I got upset with the, the Varnoff. And it's no disrespect to Jack Veracy's. Uh, well, I guess I'm, I'm calling him out. <laughs> but, you know, if you've I got... I don't know him personally. I'm sure he's a yeah. great guy. I have no idea. <laughs> right, right. Well, I'm just saying, you know, but if you've got an animal, because you, you would totally do that. You would say, okay, what does a giraffe sound like? I can see you totally saying, you know, what would a giraffe sound like? And then you would say, well, they got a long neck, so they're going to look like this. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know and, and, and you would make that work in the character. Whereas all I got was some guy with a British accent saying he was a Panther. And I said, this is not working. I'm not happy. <laughs> you know? So like I said, I respect, uh, you know, the, the stuff that you do so much because you put thought into it, you know, and, and just talking like that, I, I understand exactly why, you know, the time that you put in is so, so limited. Cause I can remember I would gotten on discord, which I told you many times I do not do because spoilers, <laughs> You know, um, spoiler. huge spoilers, all yeah. the spoilers. <laughs> yep. And I, I was really, I was really jazzed because I wanted to hear you doing the wandering in and you were working on, I don't know what the other book was you were working on. I can't remember. My brain is just, it, it doesn't work. Swing that shift. Well. Okay. Swing shift. Okay. Swing shift, yeah. and, and you were like, that, and you're like, okay, guys, I've got to get like an hour in of the wandering in. So we're going to switch over here. And I'm thinking, my gosh, how long have you been working on this one? And you're going to go over to that. You know, you yeah. probably you put in the time. And those, that, those days I run about three hours because then I'm able to do it's you do one character. Well, it depends. Now I don't do that as much just because it is so wearing. But at the time I was trying, I was pulling, you know, two and a half to three hours because I was doing both books at the same time and both books had to get done. So yeah, those, that was rough. Those were, that was rough. That was a bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think I think uh, unless uh, you, you want to keep chatting, I, and it's been about an hour since we got started here, and I promise you to keep it short. Um, and I, I really, I really try not to keep you up all night. You know, and I'm, I'm surprised my phone hasn't rang um, since we started. <laughs> I said as soon as we start, I'm going to get a call, and I've got to go. I can just see it happen. <laughs> so um, you know, like I say, I, I and, and for the the listeners that they're, they're tuning in right now and they're, they're watching us. This has been, and Andrea will, will test this. We have tried to do this so many times <laughs> to get this interview to happen and everything, if it could go wrong, it would go like, Andrea, I'm sorry. I haven't slept in three days. 
and I'm going to bed or, you know, something, whatever it was. Mine was citywide internet outage for yeah. two days. Two yeah. days I had a citywide internet outage. And then it was not getting out of the booth until 8.45 at night. And I was like, I'm so sorry, Ray. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then we tried to record and it didn't work. And, you yeah. know, it's just been one thing after another. Like I said, I'm waiting for the ceiling to fall or something to happen. <laughs> There, there's going to be a gas explosion and I'm going to get rocketed into the sky, something along those lines. So we've really tried very hard to make this happen. I'm so glad I've had this opportunity because you are an amazing person and I, I very much appreciate all the work you do. Uh, like I said, I don't think I've ever heard a book that you did that I didn't love uh, and genuinely mean that. Like there are books I can say I, other people have, have narrated. And I'm like, hey, it was okay. You a hundred percent. I've listened to them and I'm like, that's a damn good book, man. I'll tell you what, you know, my wife's got to listen to me talk about, you know, how good this was or how good that was. Or I'll talk about like, you know, one of my favorite characters is Gothy and Andrea <laughs> just plays Gothy so well. It just amazes me. She's like, who's Gothy? And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> I can't go into it. Or I'll talk about kill the catch or, you know, um, you know, you, you name them and I could go through, I could probably go through and tell you, you know, sin is my favorite from, you know, uh, Somnia and, uh, you know, wandering in, Kill the Catch was probably my favorite voice. Um, uh, any Iran book you've done, I just, I, I can't even tell you that you've done so many that I, I, I'm blown away. Um, but but with, with the Hobgoblin, and I can't think of her name off the top of my head from Dan the Barbarian, um, she was amazing. Popper, um, you know, the, the, you just have memorable characters one after another. Uh, it, just, it just keeps me glued. So I keep coming back to everything you do. So I, I do... The Hobgoblin was Ula. I just remembered Ula. it. It was driving me crazy in my head. Ula. I was like, Lola? Ula, Ula. Yeah, 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 because I, I sang that stupid song, Be a Hot Sun in the Summer. Ula. Yeah, I can remember that. <laughs> You're right. Darn it. I, you see, I'm getting old, Andrew. This this is gray and it's, it's not getting darker. You look fabulous, darling. And not enough is said for how much you do for us. Thank you for leaving reviews and supporting us and being amazing. You are awesome. To, no, the, just... you, we all rooted for you. I, I don't know anybody who didn't want you to become the audiobook podcast person. When you did, it was the greatest thing ever. Your reviews were already a bright spot for us. So to to make it so that now we get to see you while you're giving those reviews. Well, I, I appreciate it. I have to wait to watch your reviews because I'm just like, oh, no, this is going to be the day. This is going to be the day. It's going to be the day he hates the book. It's going to be the day he hates the book. No, okay, think, it's going to be fine. I think you're safe. I don't think I would ever hate anything you do. But, uh, you know, I, like I said, it's nothing but love for you because I'm just amazed with everything you do. And, and, I, and I really, really do appreciate you taking the time and for breaking me into doing um, an interview because I've never done that before. Uh, I hope it comes across that I knew what I was doing or at least looked like I knew what I was doing or had done research Absolutely. or something. Yeah, so. <laughs> Absolutely. But no, I thank hope you. I didn't babble too terribly. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're very articulate. You know, so thank you. no worries there. Um, but yeah, thank you again for everything. And and thank you. You'll see the review here real soon. Yay! <laughs> you don't even know what it is, do you? You don't even know no. what I have. Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't I don't heap a whole like it's not all praise. I do say some things about characters that okay. I, I, I was kind of, I was kind of struck with. Um, but I, I, I still say it was, it was a great book. It's one of the best books I've ever listened to. Uh, so, you know, and, and again, I, I think that I can't think of anybody else that would deserve this more than you. And I, I love a lot of narrators, but this is probably your crown jewel, so to speak up to this point. So, you Thank know, you. congratulations, congratulations. The next one comes out probably sometime next summer, I'm guessing. And that's going to be what, 105 hours. Okay. Uh, from what I can tell, I don't have a word count on it yet, but from what I can tell, it's half again as long. So it's probably going to be about 65, 70 at my current reading rate. So probably about 70 hours. Wow. Hopefully it comes in under that. That's going to be pretty long. So yeah, I, don't, I don't know if my phone can handle Like I said, um, one of the things my phone, it won't let me do anything like over 12 hours. And I, I, if I, if I say over 12 hours, I've got to delete stuff off my phone. I said, well, I'll never get to listen to this book. And I downloaded it and I was playing. I'm like, holy crap, it's a miracle. And I'm looking at the word. And that's why Yay. I was yeah, straight through. I was like, I'm not stopping. <laughs> so, that's awesome. Yeah, it was amazing. I don't, and, and I still, I can't even do like nine hour books anymore. It's like, it's still saying no, no. <laughs> so, 
yeah, it was, it was one of those, there was a miracle that happened. I was praying and said, please, Lord, let this happen. So but, uh, <laughs> again, I, I would really much like to thank you for everything. Um, I hope this was fun for you. Um, and, and you know me, anything you need, you let me, let me know. Okay. Thank you, sir. Take care. You too. Well, gang, I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to that. Uh, I have to say I had an amazing time uh, talking with Andrea and listening to this book. Uh, I'm of no doubt that this is probably one of the best books uh, there is in Lit RPG or anywhere, really, if for fantasy or whatever you want to call it. Uh, no matter what kind of genre you slam it into, it's just really, really good. And I hope you you do understand that it's it's one of those things that I can't recommend more highly enough. I might have had some issues with some of the characters or things like that, but that's my own thing, and I explained exactly why I felt the way I did, and I stand by it. It doesn't mean that I didn't like listening to or reading uh, the, the story as it went through about the characters. You know, even if I had a, a beef personally with them, the the power of the story itself is so great that. I can st still not like a character, but still love the book. And that's the, that's the true mark of an amazing craftsman. Uh, so Pirate Abba, thank you for that. Uh, and I want to point this out to everybody. I did invite Pirate Abba to participate. Uh, I received a very nice uh, letter back saying, thank you, but no thank you. I try to keep my identity secret. I don't know who he or she is either. As Andrea said in the beginning, she did not know. Um, it's top secret. But, um, you know, they were offered the opportunity to come on and do things. And I think, um, and I, I don't want to read too much into it, they offered to let us read a few bits of something that they had written uh, as well. But I, I decided if, if they didn't want to participate, that was fine. I didn't want to have Andrea do more work for the show. Uh, that wouldn't have been fair to her. Uh, so one thing I do want to recommend, or I, I, I forgot, so I, I want to bring up before we leave, is that... Andrea did win an award for her work on Dominion of Blades. Uh, you know, Popper's an amazing character. Uh, I love Popper a lot, and her work did earn her an award. I think it was at the, the Here Now Awards not too long ago. So I, I just, forgive me for not bringing that up, Andrea. I hope that you understand. Uh, we just got into the conversation and things happened, and I did not bring that up. So. Uh, again, I want to thank Andrea for stepping in and doing this. It was both of our first times doing an interview or being interviewed. Uh, and it's not easy. Sometimes, you know, you wonder what kind of questions should I ask or what should I do? And she made it so much easier for me um, just because of her awesome personality it clearly comes through here. Um, love Andrea to death. And I thank her so much for the opportunity. So, folks, I hope you enjoyed this singular book special. Uh, we do have the Dungeon special coming up soon. And I want to get that out around Halloween, so it'll be the next one we do. Oh, my gosh. So, until next time, my name is Ray. Keep listening. <laughs>